I was asked to uh, present a few challenges. First, I'm going to get us all depressed in three different areas. And then to leave you on an upbeat note, I hope that we can find six joint solutions and tipping points. You know, the word tipping points is often used as something negative. We reach a tipping point, and then after that, there's no point, there's no way to return, there's no coming back. It's all just, just as well, we might as well just give up. But I chose the word tipping point in a different way. The tipping points where we see that this is where we finally decided to do good, where we finally, as mankind or as Kikwanstas Bo or as citizens, decided that yes, there's no way of going back to the old and unsustainable. Let me um, start with the one that worries me the most. Climate change, so this is challenge number one. Of course, climate change has always been there, and for those of you not so familiar with the subject, you will easily see that um, when CO2 emissions go down, so does temperature. When CO2 emissions rise, so does temperature. This has been the case for more than 400,000 years, over several different ice ages and uh, periods of warming. Uh, so. Those of you or those of us who say that climate change is new, we're clearly wrong. Now, what is different compared to the previous 300,000 years or even more than that uh, is that this is where we are at now. And I don't, I don't know because a lot of you guys, I don't know yet, but I, so I don't know if you're gamblers or not, but if you are gamblers, I think you should take the opportunity to go into one of those gambling sites, Unibet or one of those, and see if it's possible to bet that even though this has been correlating for 300,000 years, the next time it won't. Because obviously the odds are, the probabilities are, that when CO2 rises, so will temperature again, like it always did before. And with business as usual, and that includes all the targets that have been taken. It doesn't include Paris because Paris has not been ratified yet. But everything that's been ratified, everything that's been through, put through parliament all over the world, with business as usual, those are the CO2 equivalent emissions in 2050. So most likely temperature will go up again, continue to rise. We're in uncharted territories here. So those that think, well, we're not really sure, they're right. We've never tried this one before. It might be that in our part of the world, temperatures will actually go down because with a lot of melting ice, the Gulf Stream finds it harder and harder. We know that already. It finds it harder and harder to reach our part of the world. Now, of course, I think that, and this is me, telling the truth to you because the doors are closed and we can speak openly. I think that when we uh, discuss climate change, we've been making a mistake. When we say that temperatures rise in Kijuansta or in my part of Sweden, uh, what, is what is people's reactions when we say it might become two degrees warmer? Sounds nice, right? How about three degrees? I heard there's a possibility of reaching four degrees. We just give up that biogas thing. Let's focus on the diesel instead. Maybe we can get four degrees. That sounds a lot nicer. So I think that when we talk about climate change, we really need to refocus. We need to talk about how large parts of Skåne and Kyrgyzstan and other parts of the world are not going to be near the sea, but below the sea. How the uh, cellar is going to be flooded and how a world beyond two, degree, two degrees is uninsurable according to the Worldwide Federation of, of Insurance Companies. How, and I'm going to use the Swedish word here, how the Swedish forests in Småland a few years ago looked like Plokepin. Or how the forest outside of my summer house, outside of Sala, just burnt down. Now, of course, one forest storm or one forest fire, that's not climate change. But the climate scientist says that that is the new normal unless we start fighting this. And I'm going to come back to how we can fight this, and certainly municipalities doing their best is part of the equation. My second challenge that I want to bring up, and I'm very glad that Kufansta already brought it up in a positive sense, is that mass migration multiplies. A lot of people from across the board politically and opinion makers of all hues and colors uh, think that the migration situation now is something unique. That's not true at all. If we go back 200 years, you will see that this part of the world, Sweden particularly, was a country of ma mass exodus. More than one third of all Swedes left Sweden, many of them because they had to. There was no way to earn a living in Sweden. 
people were starving, or they had to because they were persecuted for their religious beliefs or otherwise. And some of them just left because they saw better opportunities elsewhere. Now, that mass exodus slowly changed 30s, 40s, 50s into uh, Sweden being a net immigration country. It started with people from Finland, we had many people from Turkey, I've got many Chilean friends who came in the 70s, and now the, the tide has changed so much so that we're approaching a situation that looks exactly the same as Sweden was 200 years ago, but totally opposite. And when you look at the experts on migration, UNHCR for instance, they say that this is just the beginning. And we know that also from our own families and relatives and friends, that many of us migrate much more than before. And most of us don't migrate because we have to, but because we're fortunate enough to be able to. We like to live a few years somewhere else, like I did myself in Kenya and Chile. We like to study abroad. We got friends, families, lovers elsewhere in the world that we like to meet. And then we also know that those that have to leave are going to be many more. 2015 and 2016 most probably is going to be the first years ever where most refugees are not even included in the refugee definition. And the UNHCR says that that's just going to, the most biggest increase in refugees is going to be the climate refugees and the environmental refugees. Some of them are just going to leave the village because it's been destroyed by emissions by polluted water. Some of them are going to have to leave their country, Bangladesh, perhaps even Skåne. Skåne is not a country, even though we would want it to be. Uh, uh, and those are not included in the uh, refugee definition, because in the 50s, that climate change was not really on the top of our agenda. So mass migration is going to multiply. And that is something that we need to tackle in a much better way than saying that, hey, we need two, three years to think about this, and then, then maybe things will have changed. No, they will not have changed. We need to see this as the new normal. Third challenge for you guys to discuss during these days, peak everything. Everything. Let's start with uh, fish that we know that most of the oceans are depleted from, from fish. If we want fish, we need to grow them on land. Last year was the first year ever where most of the fish consumed was not from the oceans, but from aquifers and, and cultivated fish. We've got the rare earth metals that we know we're going to reach a peak very soon. And that's very important because when we say we want to go to electric mobility, well, we need those rare earth metals. We need to find a solution for that. We got Peak, maybe not peak water, but peak usable water. Clearly, that's a thing that we need to discuss much more in this part of the world where we've always been taking clear water for granted. We got peak biodiversity. Of course, I think we already peaked that. We see that the rate of extinction of a species is growing faster than ever before. And I think that's one species that we care about more than perhaps the others. And we see that as a distinct threat for us as well. So those are just a few of the peaks. There's also some other peaks that would be interesting to, to uh, discuss with you. Peak shopping, peak consumerism, for instance. You saw that the worldwide leader of Tesco, which is one of the biggest brands in the world, said that he sees that future consumers are less inclined to consume as much as the last generation. I live next door to Mall of Scandinavia. They're terribly disappointed that not as many people want to go to the mall as they thought. Well, maybe that's because they use the rear view mir mirror to predict the future. People used to want to go to malls, now people want to order on eBay or the computer. And when we order on the co computer, we're less inclined to just buy things that we saw in the shopping window because we liked it when we saw it. So those are the, those are the three main challenges I like to bring forward. And then a few thoughts for possible solutions. The first one, and I think most of you, all of you, have seen this one before, perhaps a few Less of you have seen this one, but this is much more important. Because when we discuss climate change, I see that many people go directly from denial to despair. The denial, we've all heard that, we've all been there. Maybe not in climate change, but in other areas. We've said, well, that's not really sure. It could be, it could be the volcanoes. It could be some kind of solar movement. It could also be that those emails leaked from the IPCC show that they're just cheating. Now, we don't meet many of those denials anymore. 
That's a good thing, but when I meet one, I give them a big hug because they're super important to keep us sharp. So when you see them, please give them a hug from me. But what we do meet a lot now is those that went directly from denial to despair. That is now so very sure, so there's no reason for us to even try and fight it. What can little Kifransta do? What can little Sweden do? What can my small family, our small country, our small company do about climate change? A few years ago, we used to say, when one billion Chinese are buying fridges. Now we say, when one and a half billion Chinese are buying cars. A few years from now, we'll say, when two billion Chinese are all going on charter trips around the world. Now this is what keeps me awake and keeps me getting up in the morning and saying, yes, it does matter. Yes, there's opportunities. Yes, there's possibilities with climate change. Because look at this. The green is a global GDP growth. Tilvext. Now, many of you will say, well, Tilvext GDP growth is not a great way to calculate welfare. Well, that's the way we globally decided to use. Let's stick with that for the time being. And the blue is global CO2 emissions. And now, first look at this. Yes, we have had reductions in CO2 emissions before on a global level, but they all, all always coincided with the economy going down. Now, a few of my friends will say, well, that's the way to solve climate change. Let's all consume less. Let's all have a worse time than before. Now, most of us know that that's not the way to create a supermajority when we leave this building. So what we need to find is a way to combine increased welfare with reduced emissions. And yes, that has already happened. 2014, the 2015 figures are not out yet. The 2014 was the first year ever of a global decoupling ever. We had global welfare going up, and we had global CO2 emissions going down. For the first time ever, an absolute decoupling. Now, in Sweden, this is not news. In Sweden, we've been decoupling for more than 30 years. The OECD, when they came to Sweden, they said, hey, you're the world experts in, in absolute decoupling. You've been increasing your welfare and reducing your emissions. Now, some of my friends say, well, that's not really true. We mainly exported our emissions. Look at what we're, if I were here 30 years ago, this would not be a computer, this would be a faucet typewriter made in Sweden. My suit would be made in Sweden, my watch would be Swedish, most of the stuff in here would be Swedish, and most of it is now made in China, Korea, Japan, elsewhere. And then we say, hey Chinese, you're increasing your emissions, bad guys. Well, whose emissions are they really increasing? So perhaps the Swedish decoupling was not really 100% true, but this is 100% true. Nobody can claim that, oh, we exported our emissions to Mars or Jupiter. No, there's no other way for those emissions to go. So we finally did manage to reduce our emissions while increasing our welfare. How many of you have children? How many of you know when your child, your firstborn, took the step number 5,000 or 1 million? No one knows, no one cares. We all know about the first step, because that first step, stupid as it may look, except for the parents, hard as it may be, that's the one that counts. We know that after that, it's just going to go by itself. The first steps, though, you need to applaud, you want to document it, you want to send the pictures to the proud grandparents, and this was only the first step. Of course, we need to go down here, but we did take the first step, and that's the most important one. Second tipping point, we heard that already from Kirkansta. We have had a discussion, and I'm disappointed with six of my eight parties in parliament that they see, tend to see, a refugees mainly as a problem and not so much as an opportunity. I see different movements from across the political board, at least from seven parties, saying that, yes, this is an incre incredible opportunity, because look at this. This is the workforce, the ratio of workers to pensioners in all of the Western world. We're soon down to just more than two of us, or two of you, that are going to have to support the rest of us as retired people. And then you go from Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern and Western Europe, you see the same in all of the developed world. And then we see municipalities, mainly in the north of Sweden, Breke, for instance, that say, hey, finally we get people to come here who are of work age. Many of them are already educated. They're ready to start working immediately. Bring them on. In Canada, where I'm going next week, there was a, the national government divided the number of Syrians 
between the different states, Ontario and others. You get 50,000, you get 125,000, you get 10,000. And then there was an outcry, an uproar between the different states saying, we need more than that. We can't accept only getting 15,000. That's not nearly enough to support where we want to be in the future. We haven't seen much of that discussion in Sweden as yet, but I know it's going to come very soon because the pure statistics say that, yes, we do need them. And I think many of them are not going to stay for long. Many of them just come here because they have to wait until they can go home safely. Some of them just come for a few years of work experience. Some of them we might challenge. We might give them the opportunities to stay around longer. That's going to be our main challenge. Not how we can house 100,000, but how we can make many of them want to stay. Third tipping point. First, let me go through this, this uh, little chart here. It's interesting because you will see here, PV is <coughs> PV. Photovoltaic, wind is wind. <laughs> and those small things here, those are the IEA, the International Energy Agency, how they predicted that the development would be in installed capacity for wind and for solar. Now, what they did, they took the rear view mirror in 2000 and said, well, we're going to be here in 2010. Then in 2002, new report took the rear view mirror again and said, well, in 2010, we're going to be here. And then the green, we got those hippies in Greenpeace. They're sitting in rubber boats somewhere, probably chasing whale hunters or something. And then on their spare time, they do some kind of diagnosis, whatever. This is where they ended up. And in fact, and this is between us, in fact, when Greenpeace held their press conference about predictions for solar, the global CEO of Greenpeace said, I don't want to be at the press conference. I'm going to look ridiculous. This is not credible. And then we got in black what actually happened. We got the ketchup effect. We got full on, it goes slow. You need somebody who hits the bottom of the flask and then full speed ahead. And very embarrassing for the IEA. Every government in the world uses the IEA for their predictions, for de deciding on how much nuclear do we need, how much coal are we gonna import, what kind of taxes are we gonna have? And they were wrong by a factor of 10. And I don't know any government that uses Greenpeace for the predictions, but perhaps we should listen a little bit more to the most optimistic ones because at least they're approaching the truth. Now, this has been the truth until now, and this has been mainly policy-driven. 2016 is going to be the first year ever when this is market-driven mainly. 2016 started, I was in India at the time, it started, you might remember the story, with an Indian billionaire, you know, they got the most billionaires in the world, an Indian billionaire who was investing in a huge coal power plant, who at the very last moment, before signing the paper, said, I'm switching to solar. Now, was he convinced by do-gooders as us? No. He was convinced by the economic realities. It doesn't make business sense to do coal. It makes business sense to do solar. You see the same movement, not with Trump, unfortunately, but otherwise in the Republican Party, in Texas, for instance, where they do solar just because it makes business sense. They don't want to, most of them are even climate skeptics, but they still do solar. In 2016, the global predictions, this time the IEA might actually be right, is that this is the first year ever where the most installed new capacity for electricity is going to be solar. It's not going to be coal, certainly not going to be nuclear, it's not going to be oil, even though oil price is cheap. So the oil price, cheap oil price, the uh, everything must go, oil sale, doesn't help. Solar is going to be the winner and it's now mainly market driven. Now I love when things are policy driven, but when you want to go to the bank and say, hey, I need a loan for my solar power plant or my wind power or my biogas, it's even better when it makes strict business sense incentives or not. And that's what's now happening in most of the world. More than 70% of the world uh, energy markets, solar makes business sense, incentives or not. That's a huge game changer. Fourth tipping point, we used to talk about peak oil. Let's change that, let's add a P. It's now peak oil price. We used to have more than $140 uh, a barrel. I don't believe that many of you know how much a barrel is, but you remember $140. It's now down to just over 30. And most predictions are that that's where it's gonna, be, that's where it's gonna stay. We're never gonna see those high oil prices again because we're moving out of oil. And the interesting thing here is, you remember a year ago, there was this meeting, a social meeting in New York. Do you remember Rockefeller Foundation said, we're divesting? 
We're moving out of coal, coal and oil. Remember that one? And we all applauded. We said, that's such an ethical move to do. That's such wonderful that you're standing up for climate change and really helping us in this movement. Now, those were the last ones ever to get applauded from an ethical point of view for divesting. Those of us, including my own bank, Nordea, that didn't leave oil when Rockefeller did, they had to follow this price. We used to own oil worth $100 a barrel. We now own oil worth $35 a barrel. How does that sound to you when you want to secure your pensions, your retirement funds? Terrible. It's terrible business being in something that's now worth a fourth of what it used to be worth. So we now have a global divestment that's not, well, still ethically driven. We see that in documents at municipalities, but it's mainly market driven. Get the hell out of something that's losing value by the day. And that's a much stronger driving, that's much stronger driving force than just relying on ethics. Tipping point number five that I want to bring up, second to last, is how I'm, oh good, it is small data. We've been talking big data so very much. But I think small, small data is much more relevant, and I want you to all bring up your, uh, your smartphones. Take them up. By the way, what is the uh, hashtag here? Uh, I'm not sure. Urban Magma is Urban the hashtag. Urban Magma. So if, if, yes. if you didn't tweet yet, use this instance. Um, and when I count to three, I want you all to, in, in the language that you're most comfortable with, Espanol, Dutch, whatever, just say out loud the things that you use your smartphone for. And we don't have much time, so you're going to have to be quick, because I know there's many things that you use them for. Are you ready? It can be in Swedish, English, Spanish. One, two, three. Come on, come on, more. I know it's more. SMS. More? Alice. Alice. <laughs> Next thing. <laughs> our, our Dutch friend who's uh, going to speak later, he made a smart move. He just said Alice, and then he was done. <laughs> and I heard a lot of you saying, mentioning things like, how many here mentioned bank errands? How many here mentioned maps? How many here actually got around to mentioning making phone calls? <laughs> About half of you. Most of you were focused on so many other things that a smartphone can do. And I know it, that it doesn't exist in all parts of the world, but in Sweden we used to have expect the chain. Do you remember? It was a red, white, and black logo. Remember that one, expect? Some of you, most of you forgot already. Well, expect, they believed that we need one device for all of those things that we mentioned. We need a fax. Remember the fax? We need a camera, uh, and then a separate video camera. We need a watch. I still have one, but I'm old-fashioned. We need a separate alarm watch. <coughs> we need a radio, or several radios. We need a CD player and a different CD player from when we're running, but except we can't really run when you use it because it's going to shake too much, so the CD won't work. And then we need an MP3 player. And then, of course, we need a GPS, and I could go on and on and on. And they said, well, you're going to buy all these devices from us. And then somebody else said, well, how about, uh, how about we just have one device for all of that? And then, of course, those who said, well, you need all those devices, they went bankrupt. Some of them are still around, but they try and sell fridges and other stuff as well to try and diversify their market. And this is how at least 80% CO2 emission reductions look like. When we go from a few hundred CDs in the shelf at home to all the world's music wherever you want to, you reduce, depending on how many CDs you would have, you reduce your emissions by at least 80%. When you don't have a GPS, but you got your GPS right here and all the other functions, that's also how you reduce emissions by 80%. And last year, not many people know this, this is one of the lesser known facts that I would love to, for you to discuss more. Last year was the first year when the Android operative system beat in market share all the operative systems combined for computers. Windows, 
whatever the iMac system is called, all those got 41% of the market, Android alone 59. Now what does that mean? That means that power has moved from the office to the street. That means that big data is over, billions of small data is the new thing. And some people have already started using this as the new reality. If you go to Mexico City, or another, this is the Urban Magma, but the Urban Future Award, which I attended last year in Berlin, the winner there was Mexico City. Mexico City said, well, we got huge traffic jams. We got people waiting in hours for the bus. We got the bus that can't go where it should go. And we got 20 million Mexico City inhabitants who all by now have smartphones. Let's use that as small data. Let's see where they are. We can see that some places traffic is flowing smoothly. Elsewhere, we can see here's 300 people just standing around. We need to send an extra bus. So else we can see 300 smartphones moving very slowly. Well, that street is clearly congested. Let's divert traffic. So when you start using millions and millions of small data, you get so much further and so much cheaper and so much quicker than when you continue to rely on that hype about big data. Now, last and final uh, tipping point. I brought along the Chinese flag. And I, wanna, I know that Lena is going to speak more about the Paris Agreement. And I intentionally didn't bring up Paris much. But to me, Paris itself was a continuation of a tipping point that had already happened. When we finally decoupled in 2014, that set the pace for Paris. When we had business leaders saying that, yes, we need and we want stronger climate rules, that set the pace for parents. So Paris for me was not a tipping point in itself, but it was a confirmation of the tipping point. But do you remember, if, I'm sure you saw the picture, I was there when, when they all held hands and they said, yes, we managed, we got a climate agreement. Wonderful picture, print it, have it on your wall, shows how things can be done. And a few minutes later, President Hollande took the microphone and he even tested the microphone, and then he said, "Si vous avez entendu. I heard you, world. In France, we're immediately going to increase our efforts to reduce emissions. We are going to have tougher carbon tax, tougher climate uh, measures. And then the Swedish government, Yvonne is going to talk about that soon, the Swedish government and the Milieu Målsbegredningen, a seven-party agreement that in Sweden we're also going to have tougher climate agreements than before. And, but the most strikingly for me was China. Do you remember a few years ago we said, well, I was an EU skeptic myself, but we all, m many of us said, well, if EU not, then nothing. If EU can't be the front runner in climate change, well, who can? And it seems now that because of Poland, I'm sorry, Poland, EU can't really be the front runners. We're not the front runners in climate change now. China is. And we saw that clearly just after Paris. China said, we're going to close down a thousand coal power plants just this year. And of course, you know that China often lies with its statistics. But you can't lie about a thousand coal power plants that you close down, because we can all go on Google Earth and see whether they're open or not. We can all see whether they're being shut down or not. And China said, by 2030, we're going to peak our emissions, and then they're going to go down. Well, it turns out that this time again, we can't really trust China. Because these are the actual figures. They're not going to close down 1,000 coal power plants. They're going to close down 1,254 and counting. They're not going to peak their emissions by 2030. They're going to peak their emissions by somewhere around 2025. And why? Because of all the other tipping points I mentioned. Because it doesn't make business sense to stick around in the old regime when we're all moving to the new one. And that's something I want to bring along to this table. I want us to think of perhaps not so much about sustainability as something that we should ethically be doing, but as something that we need to hurry up because the others are certainly switching into a higher gear. And if we're not, we're going to be left behind. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Matthias.
thank you for 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 bringing such uh, positive <laughs> feeling to to the table. I, I think that just like you said in the beginning, when we hear of these mega trends, that it certainly is a little bit a, a despair kind of, of feeling. Yeah. But how far do you think that we have come in in this in this movement towards actually realizing that this is business and this is something that we all need to to think of a little bit different? I think we, we often come much further than we realize. For instance, mm -hmm. I was at a different, we, had a, we have a conference that we call Ecotransport, mm -hmm. and then we give a prize to the most surprising climate solver of the year. And we gave that prize to Spotify, mm -hmm. and we gave the story that I just gave, reducing emissions by 80%, and then the person from Spotify to accept the award, she, had, she looked like she'd just come from an all-night party with Guns N' Roses. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked like she'd never given climate change a second thought. Mm -hmm. When we said, hey, you're reducing emissions by 80%, she was like, wow, I need to tell my friends and colleagues about this. <laughs> And we see that so much of what we're doing is actually getting us there without us even thinking about it. Mm. Another example is car sharing, car pooling, where they used to market themselves as climate solvers. Well, that got me and maybe you on board. But then they said, hey, how about car only when you need to? You mm. don't have to go to Bill, Besikni, or don't even have to fill, up the, fill it up with gas, you don't have to wash it. We take care of all of that. You only take the car when you need it and leave the rest to us. And then they got everybody on board. And it's now more than 50% yearly, year on year increase on those things where we combine better living with reduced emissions. Mm. But it's almost like Helene said too, that, that once you start going and, uh, and you start to think in this way, you, you gain some kind of self-esteem. And you're also, uh, also always anxious to combine those things, that, that get started, uh, adapt this kind of new mindset, and, and you will see the, the results uh, after that. That's true, and there's, there's no turning back. And I see the main drivers I see right now um, on company level, or for instance, is, uh, is employees and future employees. Mm. When we need, we're hiring, uh, when we <laughs> need to find new staff, they're asking immediately, so what's your sustainability policy? And do you live up to your own standards? Mm. And then the second is investors, mm. saying that we know that Paris is gonna mean new regulations. Are you ready for that? Mm. And, and what is perhaps not so much there is consumer demand yet. Mm. Consumer says, I want an easy, nice life. They might not necessarily move their hand to the greenest product, but they will move their hand to the product that gives them the easiest life. And that's very often the case that the product is also greenest. Mm -hmm. Those of you that took the train here this morning, many of you did, I'm sure you all worked or napped at the train. Mm -hmm. And many of you perhaps didn't even give it a second thought that this was the best climate solution, but it was the best solution for us to be efficient. Mm -hmm. So there's a different shift in that. But, yeah. And also I'm thinking with, with all the devices and everything that that actually connects us again to what Helene was talking about, bringing the children on board as ambassadors and that maybe they are adapt, uh, they can adapt to the new uh, thinking. What, is, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm sure Helene can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, more, I'm more excited about bringing the old people on board. Mm. Those 60-year-olds who move millions by a whimsical decision on the board. Mm. Um, uh, the youngsters, they might move their parents, and some of those parents will be on those boards, or their grandparents. But we now see that the old people who are, the 60-year-old mainly men, which is unfortunate given that it's Women's Day, uh, <laughs> they are finally saying, well, I need to give a better <laughs> legacy before I leave office. Uh, Obama is saying the same in the States. That's why he's so, so excited about climate change now. Mm. He wants to, to have a better story about Obama when he leaves office. And mm. we see that everywhere, and that's a huge driving force now. Mm. Any reflections from the audience? Questions? Yes? <laughs> Let me see if I actually have a... I had a microphone here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Here's one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that the Stone Age didn't end because of lack of stones. <laughs> <laughs> the same will be true for oil, I think. Uh, that's very true. The reason oil is cheap is that we're going to run out of using it way before we run out of actually having it. <gasps> true. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for, for sharing your, your you. thoughts Thank with you so us. Much. <laughs>